passage of scripture from the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12, verses 25 through 29. You have your Bible, perhaps cell phone or tablet, whatever means or device you have to look up the scriptures and highlight and note. The book of Hebrews chapter 25, verses or chapter 12, verses 25 through 29. I would entitle this message, The Unchangeable and the Unshakable. The Unchangeable and the Unshakable. If you're there in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 25 through 29, would you stand with me in honor and reverence for the reading of God's holy word this evening? Beautiful words we have here written. The Bible says, See that ye refuse not him that speaketh. For if they escape not, who refused him that spake on earth, much more shall not we escape. If we turn away from him that speaketh from heaven, whose voice then shook the earth. But now he hath promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, also heaven. And this word, yet once more, signified the removing of those things that are shaken. As of the things are made, and those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore, we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit be multiplied within our hearts and within our words and that what we hear tonight we would just take hold of and realize that you are still in charge. There is a shakening, there is an awakening. There's things to be shaken and there's things that will not be shaken. So Lord, as we study this passage of Scripture tonight, we tell you thank you in advance for the outcome. In Jesus' name, amen. Y'all may be seated this evening. In this verse, it said there are, there's coming a day when there's going to be a shaking of this old world. And it's going to be a shaking like we've never seen or heard of before. This shakening of the world. But some things will not be shaken. And you say, wait a minute now. How can there be a shakening of things not only on earth, but also in heaven, so there's a shakening of some things, but some things won't be shaken. How can that be? I mean, it would seem like that if uh, there was a whole lot of shaking going on, that everything would be impacted by it. Well, there, there is some truth to this. You see, there will be a time when the world will be pressed, and there will be no way out. There's those who will come, there's those times that will come in your lifetime that will hit you in your home. There are going to be things that are going to happen around you that are going to shake you, such as things like tension. There's going to be friction that you just wish you didn't have to encounter. You're going to have a time of troubles, and it's going to have an impact on you. If you live on this earth at any time at all, there will be a shakening. There was a shake-up in heaven already whenever Satan and those angels that chose to follow him, there was a shake-up in heaven already. So there were some things that were shaken, but some things that were not shaken. And there's going to be a shaking here. Are you ready for it? It's a simple question. Are you ready? How firm a foundation do you have? Are you ready for the shakening of the things to come? And when they do... When this shaking comes, and it's, it can come in all kinds of forms and fashions, and it presses upon you, and it seems that there's no way out, what are you going to do? How are you going to handle it when life shakes you up? Folks, I don't think that there's anybody that would question we're going through a shakening of a time frame right now. It's a global shakening. And I believe it's a time that we have as an opportunity to say, the knocking's at the door. We better get up. We better start being shaken, and we better start being awakening, and we better see what's going on. This shakening that I'm talking about, how are you going to handle it? What are you going to do during this time frame? Jesus said simply, I am the way. 
I am the way, the truth, and the life. It's a simple thing that we need to do to respond when you're shaken. I don't, when you're shaken, turn to the Lord. It's important to know that in the midst of all these changes that are taking place, and folks, there's a lot of changes that are going on in this world. Some would call it the new norm. I don't like the new norm. I'm not really fond of what the new norm is, but there is a shakening. And what the new norm is, is called change. People don't always adjust well to change. They don't always like the changes that are being made. Some just like it the way that it is. But folks, there is going to be, as Sam Cook said, a change is going to come. There's a change coming. There's a change that's taking place. There's changes in mandates. There's changes in our laws. There's changes in the world that we live in. There's changes in this place that we live in, this place that we call Earth. There's changes that happen in your body that you wish wouldn't happen. Gravity seems to take over on some of us. Can I hear an amen? amen. amen. It happens. But as long as you live here, there is a change that's going to happen. How are we going to handle it? I want you to say and think about some things in your mind. Have you ever heard the old statement, some things never what? Some things never change. And some things, you, if you don't like the weather, just wait a little while, it'll change. So there's some things that will change and some that won't change. What are we talking about here? What is the book of Hebrews even referencing? I want you to dig into just five things that I want to share with you tonight. Yes, I have more than a three-pointer, but it's going to be very quick. So hold on and jot them down in your notes. If you have a bulletin, there's a place to note this down. I want you to think about some things that never change and some things that are never shaken. Because I think we're seeing a whole lot of change going on in our world today. So I want to give you some security things. I want to be the encourager. And you can note this. There are some things that will never change. Let me tell you about them. Let me preach on it. The nature of God never changes, nor his nature, nor is his nature ever shaken. The nature of God never changes, and nor is he ever shaken. Right now, he's not rocked back on his throne saying, Oh my gosh, what's going on down there? This world's out of control. I've lost my mind. That's not God. God's nature never changes, and he's never shaken. He, is, he has not had to adjust who he is to adapt to the culture of this generation or any other generation before us. God is unchangeable. He is Alpha and Omega. He has not changed, nor will he change. Think with me for a moment of some things that have never changed or will never, ever change. Malachi 3.6 says, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Folks, that's good news. He don't have to try to change who he is to get you to like him or dislike him. He is simply who he says he is. He don't have to act one way in front of one group and act another way in front of another group. He is the same. If you talk to him tonight, he's going to be the same God tomorrow. He has not changed. And I'm glad of that. I'm glad of the fact that the same God yesterday and today, the same God throughout the generation, the same God that made the angels in heaven and made Adam and Eve, made Moses, Abraham, Joseph, Jacob, all the ones that we study about throughout the Bible, he's the same God, and he approach, we can approach him as knowing he is the same character as he was then, as he is today. Isn't that a great hope? That's a good hope. That's an encouragement. I want to tell you a second thing that doesn't change. The second thing that doesn't change is God is unchanging in his holiness. And his holiness is never shaken. God is unchanging in his holiness. We are all guilty of coming up short of God's glory. God's holy requirement. And we're all sinners and we're all in need of the grace and mercy of God. I know I am. I know I'm in the need of God's grace. I know I'm in the need of God's mercy. And that's why the Lord Jesus came. That's why Jesus Christ died on an old rugged cross. 
He died for your sins. He died for my sins. And God took those sins and laid him on the perfect, blameless, flawless Lamb of God. Could you imagine that? To take all the evil, vile things that are going on in this world today and yesterday and place them upon your innocent son. Why would he do that? He did it for you and he did it for me because he is holy and we are not. He is the one that gave up everything for you and for me. He laid them on that. Think about what God did. His holiness. There is none righteous, no, not one, that we are deserving of heaven, that we should get up there and say, God, let me in. I deserve to get in there. We are not that holy. But God's Son, Jesus Christ, was, and he came for you and for me. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill and let me tell you, you, let me tell you this, because we have a holy God. He is unchanging, but he's also unchanging in his judgment. If he says it, it's going to happen. And his holiness and his judgment stands true. I want to tell you, there's a judgment day coming. Many people don't want to think like that. Many people don't want to believe that. And that kind of preaching isn't real popular, and we're surely not going to fill up this place by preaching that kind of uh, statements, but the facts are they are still just as true today as there was yesterday and every generation before. His judgment day is coming. Amen. And there's too many that doesn't fear that judgment day that is soon coming. It's soon and it's fastly approaching. Hebrews 12, 29 says, for our God is a consuming fire. Yes, God is, we have, the God that we serve is a God of love. But he is a righteous and just God. He has not changed. And he doesn't want to send no one to hell. Hear me, hear me clearly. God doesn't send no one to hell. You choose to go there of your own desires and your own lust and your own free will. His desire is, is that all would come unto salvation. His call is available to whosoever will. But he is a consuming fire. And there is one of two places, a heaven to gain and a hell to shun. And he has not changed those two places for you or for I or for the judgment of those who have accepted him or who have denied him. The Bible is filled with stories of this kind of judgment. And did you know that the Bible speaks more about the judgments of hell than he does about the pleasures of heaven? Why does he say those things? Because if you have a child of God, you're experiencing the, you will experience the, the, the pleasures of heaven. But he tells us of the things of hell so that we will not want to go there that we will divert from going there and that we will share the scares of hell so that no one would ever want to dream to go there for it was not intended for you but yet for the devil and his angels and when I stand here and, and, and when I stand there and every single one of us are going to have to face God I want you to understand God is not changed he is the same yesterday today and tomorrow his and, and his holiness is not changed but you will have to stand before an all-knowing, all-loving, and all-righteous God. What are you going to do when that moment happens? Nobody can take your place. You can't hide from him. You can't run from him. And everyone will have to stand before him. And the Bible says, every knee shall bow, every tongue shall confess. That will take place. Why? How do I know that? Because the Bible says so. But you have a time now of a grace period to where if you confess him as Lord and Savior of your life, we can do it of our own now, or we can do it. we can bow now, or we can bow later. But the fact is, is we must stand there and we must stand there. I'm not going to ask for his justice. And I'm going to tell you, I don't think anybody in here would really be bold enough when you stand before a holy God. He's not a man. He is the creator of everything. Many would say, I'll shake my fist at him. I'll tell him this. Listen, when you stand before this holy God, you're not going to ask for his justice. And these people that are so bold and want to spit and be so vile against him, man, I'm going to tell you what, you cry out for mercy. 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 Man alive, I need mercy. I need grace. We all need mercy. We all need his grace, and we all need his forgiveness. Not a one of us doesn't need that. And let me tell you, let me tell you just something good. God loves you. And he loves you so much that he has offered his 
mercy. He has offered grace. He's offered forgiveness to whosoever will. But you have the freedom right now to choose him or to deny him. There's a judgment day coming. There is a judgment day coming. How will you stand before him? It overwhelms me in, in my comprehension that God can forgive every sin that you and I ever committed. It's hard for me to fathom that. But he can because of the wonderful works of Christ. It's not in my ugliness, in my ugliness of sin, but it's because of his righteousness and his goodness in what Jesus Christ did that is going to be making it available for me to be able to go to heaven and for you to be able to go to heaven. So let me be clear. Here, not a one of us deserve it, but the Bible says, but for in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's a gift, not of works. You can't buy your way in. I don't care how much money you have. You could be the richest individual in this whole world, but you can't buy your way into heaven. And you can't be so poor that you can just say, Lord, I never had anything here on this earth. I'm entitled. You've got to let me in. His grace is available for the least and the greatest. His love and his grace and his mercy is available to you. It's available to me. It's available to whosoever will. And we must be willing to understand his righteousness that he sent his only begotten son to die for the world and everyone in it who will freely accept him or deny him. The third thing I want to share with you is God is unchanging in his love. And I'm glad to hear this. His love is never shaken. You don't have to question, does God love me or not? You don't have to question, God, how could you love me? How could you like me? How could you even care for me? I want, to, I want you to do this. I don't often do it, but I am going to ask you. And if you're watching, please do the same. Look up here for just a moment. Normally I'm humbled. Normally I don't want you to look on me or anything else, but I've got the best news that I could ever tell you. And please hear me. God loves you. Three words. So simple. God loves you. Friends, that's good news. You say, how could he? I don't know. I have a hard time loving myself. I, I don't. I don't like myself a lot of times. But God loves you. I don't think we really think about that. God loves you. It's the best thing. It's the best news. And that's the news worth coming here for tonight. Amen. It's news worthy to hear. God loves you. 1 John 4, 19 says, We love him because he first loved you. He loves you. He loves us. That is one of the most wonderful things anybody in here could hear. And to know that God has forgiven you. God, to know that God cares for you. That to know God, the creator of everything, wants to talk to you. Man, it's amazing. That's never changed. And I'm so glad in a rapidly changing world, to hold on to the truths that God loves you. Isaiah 40 and 8 says, here for the next one. I'm, I'm skipping ahead. I'm sorry. The fourth thing tonight. Whew. God's word is unchanging in his word. And God's word will never be shaken. Man, I want to tell you that's good news to me. God's word is unchanging. And his word will never be shaken. Isaiah 40 and 8 says, The grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. I settled it in my heart a long time ago. Just because I settled it in my heart, you're going to have to do the same thing. The word of God does not change. And I'm going to tell you what, there's going to be those times that it will. you're going to be shaken. 
you're going to be you're going to have to you're going to have to wonder is this really the truth or is it not is this really the word of god i had to settle it in my heart a long time ago especially whenever i surrendered to the ministry and i'm going to stand before you and i'm going to preach this book right here i had a preacher a friend who called the question who did not believe in the full inerrancy of this book that I hold in my hand and challenged me with it. They did not believe in the full inerrancy of this book that I hold in my hand. And it called me to, and it rattled me, and it shook me to the point to where I had to wrestle within my, my life. How can I stand before them and say, is this your word or is it not? How do I do this? Is it not? It sounds like... It may sound like such a simple task, but when you're challenged, especially from someone that says, is this the full inerrancy, means that there is no mistakes, that every crossing of the T and every dotting of the I is one jot and one, jit, one tittle. That's what that means. It shall not be changed or shall not be moved. When you're challenged with that, is this the word of God or not? And it rattled me as a young young man in the faith and also as a young man being called i had to question myself is this the word of god and i remember it so well that i was i remember where i was i was out on the mower i was in the front yard and i was wrestling and i was carrying on a conversation with god i don't know about you guys but i enjoy those moments out there in the field or out there on the mower with god and just talking to god and having that walk with god and conversations with god and i'm wrestling in myself and I said, God, I've got to know, is this your word or is it not? Because if it's not, I can't do it. I have to know what I'm preaching is the truth or it's not. And I tell, I tell you what, I don't doubt this, and you can question it all you want, but I know that the Holy Spirit spoke as plain as clear and given me a remembrance of the scriptures of God. And it was Genesis 3 and 1. And that recollection and that memory and that peace, as I believe the Holy Spirit helps us interpret and study the Word of God, that whenever at Eve was having that question carrying on of a conversation there in the garden, it's the time that we first see the, the Satan and his uprising there in the garden and tempting Eve and, and, and testing her and questioning her. And the words of Genesis 3.1 we see the first words here of Satan. Yea, hath God said. Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Now, did God not say that? Yes, he did. But she went on to say, but, see, he left off a part of it. But, of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you eat of it, at least you touch it, at least you die. So, so see, Satan is notorious for wanting to take parts of the scripture and manipulate them and twist them, add to it and taking away. And the Bible says here at the very end, anyone that tries to add or take words away, they will be cursed. There is, I'm telling you what, there's some things you just don't do. God's hand is upon his word. And whenever you're questioned, and the, why, does the, why does the question come to you is the same as it did me? Because the devil is still using the same old tricks and the same old deceits and the same old deceptions of adding and taking words away and trying to manipulate it because they work. And my friends, I had to settle it in my heart. This is the word of God. It changes not. Just because I don't understand it all, just because I can't comprehend it all, doesn't mean that I doesn't, don't fathom it all. I'm not, I, I'm fine, I, he, he is perfect, I'm not, and I can't understand everything, doesn't change the fact that it is the perfect, blameless, flawless, love letter of God given to us. And when we read it, do you really understand the opportunity that we have to hold this book in our hand? The book of God is unchanged forever and ever. The word of God this heaven and earth will fall away, but the word of God will never change, and it will never fail. That, to me, gives me such hope. And I'm, I'm so glad for an unchanging word. He doesn't say something today and say, yeah, I changed my mind. 
No, he is the same today, yesterday, and forever. There's a fifth and final thing that I want to share with you this evening. God's way of salvation has not changed. And his salvation is unshakable. Man, I'm so glad to hear that. There's not a new way or an old way. God's way of salvation is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. I want you to understand all these days, God's way of salvation is still the same. All these weeks, still the same. God's way of salvation. All these years, still the same way of salvation. All these decades, all these centuries, every hundred years, all these millenniums, every thousand years, all 6,000 millennials, God's way of salvation has not changed, and it was the same way in the Old Testament as it is in the New Testament, and it is by faith. And you must have faith in God and faith in His Son, Jesus Christ. For John 14, 6 says, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. His ways of salvation is still the same. You see, everything in the Old Testament pointed to Jesus Christ coming. And everything in the New Testament points to Jesus Christ's return. And folks, his return is coming. And the only way that any of us can be saved, for he died for the saints of old, and he died for the saints today, and he'll die for the saints tomorrow if there's a tarry, his way of salvation is still the same, and it's through the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad for that? Can I hear an amen? Amen. It's the only hope we have. Amen. God will never change. I've given you several things right now in a changing world that you can cling to and that you can hold to that will never change. But you and I must change. You and I must change. We cannot live life apart from God and think that we're going to inherit the treasures of God. We cannot live life in our own way and thinking we've got it all and thinking I'll just wait, I'll ride it out, I'll make that decision tomorrow, I'll make that decision next week, I'll make that decision next year, and so forth, folks. You must change. Some have said I shall not be moved. My friends, we must change. And my prayer is this. Help me to decrease so that he can increase and help me to be more like him and less like me. And in order to do that, you must be willing to change. And you must be willing to lay down your life. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm glad you do not change. I'm glad your love does not change. I'm glad your righteousness does not change. I'm glad your word does not change. I'm glad your promises do not change. I'm glad, Lord God, that you're not shaken, that you're not uh, that you're not rocked back. But everything is happening just as you said it would, just as you prophesied that it would. And Lord, I'm so glad to know that by our changing of our heart. And that our changing of our mind, and that by, by, by the professing of our mouths, and you are still able, we are able to be saved. For that, we have a hope in a weird and changing world. Lord, if there's one here tonight, or if there's one watching, that needs to change, what's holding them back? Lord, I pray right now this prayer. I pray that they would accept you, a forgiving and loving and righteous God. I pray right now that they would come to an understanding that they need you in their life. While this world will let them down, you won't. And Lord, I'm praying that they would make that public in Jesus Christ's name.